Hey, it's the What If Podcast. I'm Spencer, and that's Eric Mason. Hello. What's going on, buddy? Oh, you know, just hanging in there. <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> I, no, uh, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, like... I'm good. Uh, how, how are you? I'm okay. I feel like every fucking Zoom meeting now has to start with some attempt at small talk that just instantly fails because there's no interest from any party involved. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm fine. Why? Why are you asking? <laughs> What do you Shit's mean? Are you great, trying to suggest obviously. something? <laughs> I'm doing fine, okay? <laughs> Fucking look around, bud. Everything sucks. I have pants on. Uh, nice. Yeah. Um, I feel like we need a life update from you before we get to our oh, topic sure. today, though. Yeah, well, what's, I think... Uh, what's going on with the airplanes and the school and the Mankato and stuff? Yeah, so I I am now officially a licensed pilot, which is new. Hell yeah. Congrats. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it feels really good. Uh, I am uh, being ever vigilant in my search for extraterrestrial intelligence at home um, and in the skies. Now I can add that to my wheelhouse. I am now yes. looking for skunk works and UFOs constantly. Um, there apparently has been some like weird skunk work sighting recently. Have you been seeing that stuff around LAX? No. It's like airline, well, I airline saw the, captains. The jetpack like, thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. One of the dudes from the, from the crew was like, yeah, the captain said it was a jetpack. I'm not so sure that's what that was, but okay. Um, well, it was reported by like multiple pilots, wasn't it? Yeah. But there, one of the, I feel like one of the first officers was like, I don't know if that actually was a jetpack. It seemed weirder than that, but the captain said it was a jetpack and I just said, okay. Well, and also weren't they at like 3000 feet or something? Yeah. They were, they were coming into land. Um, but I mean, that's really damn high for a jetpack. Still, that's very high for a jetpack. Yep. But yeah. So anyway, so I'm I'm flying around, and uh, we were grounded there for a while because of the COVID. But we're we're back up and and rolling now, and I am now working on my instrument license, which is going to allow me nice. to to fly through the clouds without um without being able to see anything. So, um, dude, I saw some wild airplane activity over Lake Superior this morning. Oh, really? Like some float plane stuff? No, so there must be military stuff up there still, like Air Force, I think. Okay. I know there used to be. I think there still is. Okay. So I heard like uh we were hiking through the woods and I heard a like a boom and then some pretty constant jet sounds for uh -huh. like the next few minutes. And then when we came out into a clearing and could see up, there were two jets flying like weird patterns over Lake Superior. Wow. And drop like it looked like dropping some sort of flares oh. or something. Cool. So there was like something would come out of one of the jets that would it was illuminated, looked like it was burning. And then they'd leave like little small little contrails behind them. Sweet. And they dropped probably like eight to ten of these things. I'm looking at the um the uh flyway charts right now and there is there's something called the Snoopy East Military Operations Act uh area. So there is there is like a, a train military uh like Air Force training zone over there. So I bet that's what you were seeing. Uh, that that would make sense. Yeah. Cool. That sounds fun. It was bizarre, man. Unless it was just Canadian Border Patrol getting wily. You know how they are. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking border wily. brutality up there, dude. <laughs> Yeah, uh, school's no, going uh, good though. Other, yeah, otherwise? school's going pretty. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, dude. It, it's 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 funny to be in college right now. Uh, the none of these teachers were prepared to teach in this way, and um, God, I hope they're not listening. But they're all really bad at it. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and like, it's, right, it's like, like no one, no one is good at this. Well, it's one of those things too, where like the the physical uh, space of of like a university kind of like greases the, the wheels of like, ha, like justifying paying all that tuition. And you know, you're like, Oh, oh there's yeah. these facilities and they they got parking lots and all the lights are on and they got janitors and you know, there's these doors and they got locks on them and they close the doors and then we have class. <laughs> but when it's like literally zoom meetings and you're just in your underwear at home and there's this like awkward middle-aged failed a airline pilot like give me this dry <laughs> seminar on like lift generation when you, when there's like there's like these videos from MIT with like like 
you know, amazing production value that are like on YouTube for free. It's like, man, I don't know. So it's, it's weird. Yeah. To, it's hard to justify paying all that money, but uh, I, Dude, I get I, to fly planes and that's, that makes up for it. That's super fun still. So, right. Yeah. You just got to get to the end of it. Yeah. But I, uh, I applied for this gig teaching a, it was like this small private arts college mm-hmm. teaching a like sound for visual artists oh. class. So mostly like animators and filmmakers and stuff to be like, here's a sort of a basic introduction to like how audio works. Yeah. Uh, this is how you make a drone. And it, <laughs> right. Like here's the stereo spectrum and EQ and shit. Cool. Um, but they, dude, they were offering like non-negotiable thirty-seven hundred dollars for the sem- for the semester to teach the class. Whoa! And I was like, "What in the? No wonder all of this instruction sucks." First for of a all. whole semester. Yes, That's just the price of like one student paying tuition. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Like schools are still trying to make just dumb money off of this situation. Yeah. I got an email from Mankato that said, um, don't worry. We don't plan on raising tuition this year. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, gee, thanks. thanks guys. Yeah. What the fuck? Dude, I, I swear all the, like all the big schools that started in person and are now shutting down already. Yeah. It was just a, that's just a money grab from the colleges. Yeah. Let's take all these because kids. Because if they had said up front that they were doing all online, they would have lost a bunch of students. infect all these children and then send them back home. Yeah. Yep. Especially when anyway. I'm at a state school in Southern Minnesota and I see a headline that's like, Harvard doesn't have the infrastructure to stay open. I'm like, but we oh, do? get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Harvard's like, sitting on like $20 billion. Oh, well, but at least, they, I mean, I'm like, I don't think if Harvard can't stay open, I'm pretty sure Mankato probably shouldn't be meeting in person. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is Harvard's lying. Yeah, Harvard but... <laughs> is absolutely lying about that shit. Yeah. Mankato are, probably should not be. Dude, kids are just partying and face fucking. It's all, Ugh. it's all kinds of nasty down here, dude. Gross. Yep. All right. Um, do you want to talk about how to store nuclear waste for a hundred thousand years? Yes, I would love to. Um, okay. Do you, do you kind of want to guide this? I mean, I, I know a little bit, but I feel like you're probably sure better informed than I am. Yeah. I think, I mean, there's like, I think there's three interesting phases to this topic. There's like, yeah. there's like the problem that we face and then there's the proposals and then there's like what we're doing right now and i think like the meat as as far as how it relates to like the genre of this podcast the meat of this is really in the proposals it's really in like the various ideas that people have generated to deal with this problem so yeah um so yeah i think we can have some fun with that i i'll I'll start by just giving us like a background um so so the issue is i'm sure everyone's aware making nuclear um weapons and power creates um, waste. Um, there, depending on where you go, if you go to internet.com slash, uh, nuclear power is good. <laughs> it'll tell you, we have something like 90,000 metric tons of nuclear waste. If you go to internet.com slash nuclear power is bad and destroying the planet. Um, it'll say something like, you know, 150,000 metric tons, um, or more. Uh, and that's just, in yeah, the I US. saw like two, I saw like two fifty or something today, but... like globally. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. But that, again, I'm sure that's all of these numbers are estimates. But. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many people with their their own kind of agendas around around this power, um, uh, you know, producing these statistics. But um, yeah. there, there's a there's a, a lot. And um, and it, it grows by um, uh, according to the um, nuclear. Oh, why didn't why didn't I write it down? The NAE, whatever that stands for. Um, it's increasing by about 12,000 tons a year. Um, now, obviously, this waste is dangerous. Um, you know, it can lead to lots of birth defects and cancers and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so you need a place to store it. Um, now, the good news is that nuclear waste actually does get less dangerous as time goes on. There are other forms of chemical waste that stay, uh, you know, toxic and dangerous into perpetuity forever. Um, nuclear waste does have the, the the nice thing about it is that it does eventually become less dangerous. The bad thing about it, it I mean, it eventually becomes not at all dangerous if right. you wait long enough. Right. If you if you wait long enough, it becomes not at all dangerous. But you have to wait long enough. And that is the that is the big problem. Um, there are 
uh, certain um, properties or certain uh, byproducts that have half-lives of up to 24,000 years, like plutonium, um, 239, plutonium 239. Um, TC99 is a half-life of 220,000 years. And uh, I-129 has a half-life of 15.7 million years. <laughs> and there are some people that... We're mostly using, for nuclear power, we're mostly using uranium, right? That's my understanding. Is that... Yep. And, and okay. the, most people say that the, the vast majority of this uh, high-level waste, it, b- between 1,000 and 10,000 years, is... I mean, I, I think that's a, I think that's a conservative estimate. Uh, there's, there's a German agency that says these, these facilities need to be able to last for at least a million years. Um, if, if we want to be safe. What the, yeah, come on, dude. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we've been here, we've been here for a hundred thousand years as a species, but right. we're going to build something to last for 10 times that. Right. So, th- so there's, so, so here comes the problem then. Okay. Let's build a place. Let's stick the waste in. And we just need to make the we just need to make the 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 place last for a certain amount of hundreds of thousands of years. Now that is a problem, but it is a conceivably solvable problem. It's an engineering problem essentially. Um, there's a there's a couple of pretty easy solutions, or not easy, but there's a couple of pretty um, <laughs> reasonable sounding solutions. Like there's a place in New Mexico that built a facility uh, under like a huge salt deposit, and the idea is basically like the salt w- will eventually like weigh down on the facility. It'll fill in all the spaces. It'll crush the, the containers together into this like sealed up underground um, facility that will, that will keep it safe. And because the land is, is salted uh, conceivably future generations won't try to fa- farm here. Like it, it's not a, it's not a, a particularly inviting or, or, or um, uh, you know, farmable place anyway. Um, so, yeah, well, well, I mean, I think that's important, though, because part of what makes this work is selecting a location that is not going to be otherwise appealing to future generations. Right. Like, yeah, on a very base, basic human level of like, you can't grow shit here or there's not fresh water nearby or right. whatever. Right. And that's important um, because so, some people think that it's like, oh, we, they selected this place in New Mexico because it was far away from other cities. It's like, well, no. It, it the reason it's far away from cities is because th- this land is not usable. It's not. Yeah. Th- there's nothing about it that's uh, that's that's profitable or 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 productive. Have you read about the the Finnish facility at all? The mm. one in Finland? No. So there's one. I think the the farthest along in this whole process is uh, one called Onkalo O N K A L O in okay. Finland, and they've actually built a facility that is rated or they believe will last a hundred thousand years. Oh, wow. And the way that they did it is there's a whole documentary about it from 2010 when they were like in the middle of building it, uh, called into eternity. That's, Oh, I saw YouTube that, for that free. documentary. Okay. I should watch it. Yeah. Um, it's really good. I just rewatched it today, but they, their solution was they're burying this stuff about 500 meters below ground. And they're digging into solid bedrock that has been there for 1.8 billion years. Wow. Okay. And so the idea is it's in a a location where there's like, there's no reason for people to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be like the most stable environment possible. Cause like these actual rocks have been there basically untouched for almost 2 billion years. Right. Cool. Um, but they're they're actually taking contracts or like just awarded contracts to actually start burying uh material there. Okay, gotcha. So it's so it's actually active. Or or will be seen. Yeah, they finished they finished the build, I think, last year. Okay. They're gonna start burying waste this year. Okay. And they have enough capacity You'll to, to unlock your iPhone first. Wow, thanks, Siri. Um <laughs> They they have capacity to keep building or keep burying waste there until twenty uh twenty one hundred. Okay. Gotcha. And then they'll which is like they're they're planning to bury all of the nuclear waste in Finland in this one location. And then just and then that's it. Then they stop. Yep. Because yeah, they and, think we'll probably stop using nuclear power within the next hundred years. Yeah. Well, I mean it's conceivable, I suppose. 
No, um, I mean, they seriously do. Yeah, they think we're basically going to run out of uranium right. within the next hundred years. Yeah, I mean, the, the New Mexico one, the, it's the, the WIP, the uh, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, um, right now, I think, contains the vast majority of nuclear waste that we created during the Cold War. Um, but I think I couldn't quite find a lot of information on this, but I think they had some kind of breach recently. Um, oh, good. Yeah. So, w- which is why, I mean, they, there's the second part of this that we'll talk about in a second. They were generating lots of ideas about how to, how, how to solve this other problem we're about to talk about. And they had to put that on pause because they had some sort of containment issue. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't quite find any more information about Yikes. that. Yikes. So. Um, is it... Do you know how deeply that stuff is buried? Um, I don't know that. Because no. I, I know the, the Finnish one, the main concern they had was eventually... So there, there's this whole system of like, you take the, the spent fuel rods, they're encased in one type of metal surrounded by another, and then the outside layer is copper because that's resistant to water more than other metals. Mm. And then they're buried inside, like, in these individual concrete tubes oh, cool. underground. So each one is separate from the others and so on and so forth. Cool. But their their main concern was that eventually it could, like, leak into groundwater. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the things about this. Okay. So it looks like two uh, 2,000 feet underneath the surface is this. Uh, okay. This uh, New Mexico one. It's a little bit deeper than the the Finnish one. That was yeah. like fifteen hundred ish. Yeah. Um. <laughs> sorry. I just I just in googling that I saw something else that said the wrong kitty litter led to radiation leak at New Mexico nuke facility. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to read more into that. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um. Uh. So so yeah. So we have this this um engineering challenge which is to create these facilities that not only can sufficiently contain these dangerous materials and and like you said keep them from getting into the the water table um but last for long enough Um, and we're talking about these are deep uh time scales we're talking about um i think it's really it's really hard for me to even comprehend what that means right yeah like when you the the entirety of human civilization so far well, not even civilization. The entirety of human beings as a species is less time than we're talking about here or about the same amount of time that we're talking about here. Right. Like yeah, we showed up on the planet for the first time about 100,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any record of anything going back farther than what? Like 10,000 years maybe? I think the the oldest cave painting that we've found has been has been dated to 64,000 years. But that wasn't humans, that was Neanderthals. Okay. But that's like the oldest but like, when like we, man-made like man, the pyramids I mean, man-made. are the pyramids are less than 5. Right. <laughs> Stonehenge is like about 5. Right. So we're talking about something like 20 times older than Stonehenge. Well, we and plutonium's to... half-life is 24,000 years and you need something the the thing that I was reading says that, that they they prefer to have at least ten half lives before they consider it safe. So th- we're talking twenty two hundred forty thousand years. Yes, precisely. Right. So what and and herein lies. I mean, th- this is especially the the challenge of this is that there are there are really like three different sort of time scales you have to consider. There's short term, medium term, and long term. The short term really is like. The next hundred years, how do we build these facilities and seal them? That's like the short term problem. Then there's the medium term problem, which is like, how do we, how do we keep humans from interfering with these? How how do we make sure that there's oversight? You know that we, um, uh, that, that we keep these facilities um, operable or you know safe from intrusion. And that's maybe like a couple hundred years, thousand years. Then there's the long term problem, which is how do we how do we let future generations know that there is a facility here that needs to be avoided? Or at least there are materials buried here or contained within a place that are dangerous and if disturbed could be hazardous. And this is the real 
weird problem about this topic. So there, there is um, a, a few things to consider. So if you have a civilization, like, like you were just saying, I mean, the pyramids, 5,000 years old. Imagine like the first couple of people who broke into the pyramids or who, you know, the early Egyptologists. Like, do you think that they were reading the pictographs and, and so the writings around there thinking no. like, oh, no. I wonder if there's any warnings to try to keep us out of this. And even if right. they wanted to, do you think they could? Like, there's no conceivable well, way that you would know and what's inside of this thing. I would take it a step further. And I, I would guess that even if there had been legible, decipherable warnings against opening them, we still would have. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah, like if you see something that's like a, a skull and crossbones or like a like a keep out, you know, that's an invitation. But I mean, human curiosity can't be can't be limited to, to such an extent that you don't just dive right into shit like that. I mean, that's well, I mean, you in, in a lot of ways that that cues our curiosity in a way that it wouldn't be if that messaging wasn't there. Right. I mean, we we have a context like if I stumbled on a facility and I saw the, you know, the very famous nuclear waste symbol. Um, I would know, okay, like I shouldn't be here because I'm concerned for my safety. But if I stumbled on something that said like danger, you know, keep out, but I had zero context for what that danger was. I mean, I would be, I would be super curious as to what was down there. Um, yeah. And I think that's, and that, that is one of the big problems that, that these people are forced to think about. And the the first time that there was really a big conversation, at least in the U.S., about this was in 1981. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy commissioned a task force called the Human Interference Task Force. And this was... Sounds so alien. <laughs> it really does, yeah. <laughs> Anytime humans write something and put human in the title, I just, I'm automatically suspicious human of Human interference task, especially because this is coming out. I mean, this is on the heels of the wacky, like, U.S. Department of whatever, like, weird programs, you know? Like, the, this is like... You said it, this was 91? This is 81. 81. Yeah, so this is still, like, uh, it, it's right off the heels of, like, the you know, the let's just give everyone acid and see what happens. Heyday of like the U- U S department of whatever's, you know, there, and this is like in <laughs> US the departments of whatever. Yeah. And there, you know, various, this is, various three letter agencies doing illegal shit with our tax dollars. Exactly. You know, and it's, it's pretty close to Reagan star Wars program and all just the, just weirdo U S government stuff. But the thing about this one is that it's not some secret shadowy agency doing something, um, you know, illegal or, or, or bizarre, it, it is, I mean, it's an essential question that they really publicly um, asked people to, to reckon with. And, and the problem is, how do you send a message thousands or hundreds of thousands of years into the future? Um, and, and, you know, we're talking about like the pyramids and that's in the context of like a, a human civilization that has been relatively, I mean, there's, there's, um, there's an unbroken line of humans from then to now. I mean, there are certain civilizations right. have been wiped out, but for, for the most part, there's a, there's a continuity there. Um, there's a continuous record at least. Right. But if you had some sort of ecological disaster where, which there's going to be in a hundred thousand years, of course will be um, inevitably um, you're going to have a, a loss of that context. That's so crucial for us to decipher symbols and warnings like this. Um, you're going to have a loss of language. I mean, even if there isn't an ecological disaster, you're going to have a loss of language. You're going to have a loss of um, symbols. Like if I see a skull and crossbones and something, I might think danger. But even now there's other people in the world that, you know, skulls, like candy skulls or something, have, have a totally different meaning. It's not, you know, it's not danger. It's, it's something completely different. Um, so uh, to add on to this, because like that's that's one level of complexity and challenge but it almost doesn't matter because how physically would you even deliver a message right we don't have any way of writing or creating images that will last on the surface of the earth for a hundred thousand years right yeah like the only thing you can use is stone yep 
like, any like sort of Stonehenge like, might be a huge warning about something that we're just like we just have no idea what that warning is. Right. <laughs> like e- even carving into it maybe would survive that long, yep. but like that's not guaranteed. You can't paint on it. You can't. You almost like any attempt at language or images almost is pointless. Right. And even if you, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a few people who have proposed like um, a series of images that would um, portray danger or like a person getting close to a thing and then getting sick and then like dying. But then you're, you're assuming so much. You're assuming that they, you know, maybe read left to right is in a sequence of images. You're assuming that they understand even like causality. (laughs) You know, if you just go right to left, it's a person like, be, yeah, being, being like, born, yeah. getting healthier and getting healthier as they visit this place. Yeah. Like losing, <laughs> losing some sort of symbol. Like, wow, you can, you can shed all your demons in this underground layer here. And then this place gives you superpowers. It heals all. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so you have this, this, this human interference task force in any one. And basically what it is, it's U S department of energy and it's, it's a group of, uh, physicists and sci-fi authors and artists and s- semioticians and linguists. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, this would make a great film. I think it, it's, it's a ragtag group of um, scholars and experts who are brought together to answer this question. Um, and they, they think about it a lot. They, they think about like, um, yeah, all the various challenges that we're proposing right now. I mean, even just like trying to read something like Beowulf from like a thousand years ago from the original, uh, you know, without a translation, it's like almost uh, unconceivable that, that a layman would be able to understand any of it. And that's just a a thousand years ago. You know, I mean, that's, that's not that old. It's a 1% of what we're talking about here or less. Right. Um, so they came up with a few, um, like a, a basic rubric, that this, this message would need to communicate. And I, I, this is where it starts to get weird. And the, and the reason I love this is because <laughs> you really are talking about an, 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 unconceiv- an inconceivable amount of time and, and a creepy message that you have to sort of distill. And, and when you distill messages like this, it does, like, you get this unnerving, it is a really unnerving feeling to, to contemplate what you're trying to communicate to, to, to this, to the future generations. So, so here, here's the rubric that they came up with that this message should comp should comprise of four levels of increasing complexity. Level one is the rudimentary information that something man-made is here. Level two, it's cautionary information. Something man-made is here and it is dangerous. Level three, basic information tells what it is, why it is, when it was made, where it is, who made it and how. And level four, complex information, which would be like highly detailed records, tables, figures, graphs, maps, diagrams. That's all assuming that any of the uh, previous levels were were um, conceivably understood. Um, so they th- it, there's there's a translation of of their basic um, message in a 1993 report called the Sandia National Laboratory Report, um, and, and they have a, a sort of basic like in your ideal world, what would the message be if you could just say it in English? Um, and, and say it mm-hmm. in a way that you thought the person would understand, what would you say without getting technical? And here's what they wrote. This place is a message and part of a system of messages. Pay attention to it. Sending this message was important to us. We considered ourselves to be a powerful culture. This place is not a place of honor. No highly esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing valued is here. What is here is dangerous and repulsive to us. This message is a warning about danger. The danger is in a particular location. It increases towards a center. The center of danger is here, of a particular size and shape below us. The danger is still present in your time as it was in ours. The danger is to the body and it can kill. The form of the danger is an emanation of energy And the danger is unleashed only if you substantially disturb this place physically. This place is best shunned and left uninhabited. It reads like a damn riddle to find a treasure. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Exactly. It does. I mean, it's, it's an invitation for investigation. Um, So, So parts of this message, even in this sort of reduced, simplified form, are still so contextual right 
or like so specific to our time and our culture and our way of thinking, like nothing, nothing valued is here. Yeah. Well, how do you know? Yeah. Nothing valued based on us now and what we value. Yeah. There's a sense of this great shame about this place. It's shame and danger. Like this could read on like a, a commemoration on like a site of a great battle or something where it was like a Pyrrhic victory where there was great losses on both sides. Like you could put this on the beaches of Normandy and it'd be like, yep. You know, (laughs) that (laughs) that sounds accurate, you know? But like, even just logistically like that, that third point you said uh, that you read, this place is not a place of honor. Nothing, no esteemed deed is commemorated here. Nothing valued is here in that uh, entering eternity documentary they ask one of the scientists working on the project in Finland if he thinks it's possible that nuclear waste will actually be valuable in the future. Mm. Wow. And he immediately says yes. Right. Because especially as it becomes less dangerous, you can reuse it. And it's only going to get more rare the farther we go in time. And if you treat it like this, like precious hidden thing that's like entombed in some like puzzle underneath the ground. (laughs) Right. Well, and he was saying it in the context of like, even if you can convey that this is dangerous. Sure. People may choose to disturb it in spite of that. Right. Right. Yeah. And because of that. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Okay, so here's here's where it gets real fun. Um, so okay, we got our message, and it's, it's problematic for all the reasons that that you mentioned, but but it is a message that we want to communicate. There, something's dangerous is here. Don't fuck this with shit this. This will kill you. This will kill you. Right. And then they yeah. can decide. Well, fuck it. I want to try to fuck with it anyway. Okay. Well, then you're an idiot. But at least you got the message, right? <laughs> That's the important part. So so I I do have one question before we jump to the solutions, though. Okay. Or a, a couple questions about why we need these solutions mm. or if we need these solutions. Mm. So like, yes, nuclear waste is dangerous. Uh, the levels of radiation that are happening from this high, high level waste right now would kill us quickly. It could make like entire parts of the planet uninhabitable. Right. But are we, by doing this messaging of all the types that we're going to get into, are we actually calling more attention to it than we need to? Yeah. Like, could some of this actually be avoided by making this as inconspicuous as possible, relying on more of the, uh, the engineering side of it of like, how do we make sure that this stuff is not disturbed? Mm -hmm. How do we make this as stable as possible for as long as possible? And then through choosing locations that are not going to be useful for other things where you're not going to want to drill, where you're not going to want to dig or build things or like, because if you lived on the surface here, you'd be fine. Right. It's really only if you dig down directly into this stuff and were to disturb it hundreds of meters underground. Right. And I think there are also arguments for if you're able to dig hundreds of meters underground in an organized way you have some other technology available to you. The concept of radiation is probably not foreign to you. Mm -hmm. Like radiation is not a time specific or culture specific concept. Like it's present throughout the entire universe. Right. So I would think if future generations have the ability to dig, to excavate, to build, they probably also know about radiation. Yeah. And if it is something like, like if it's just a, a sentient, um, species of like mole that develops after humans are wiped out. They're not going to see your signs on the surface anyway. So fuck them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that is so actually, I, I, I think that that is one of the, I mean, on, on the scale of like um, reasonable proposals to like batshit insane proposals, the, the <laughs> step one, the, the, the level one is just like, let's not, you know, let's, let's just build this in such a way that it doesn't actually draw any attention to itself. Let's just bury it and have it be a totally normal looking place. Um, And then, you know, just make sure it's not on any fault lines or like near any active volcanoes or any reason that it might rupture and and reach the surface. 
Um, yeah, and, you don't want it to naturally be exposed, obviously. Right. But signs aren't going to stop a volcano either. No, so. they are. Exactly. But but they might <laughs> let a civilization know, like, if there is an earthquake over here, yo, this this rupture might be happening. You might need to contain this and do a Chernobyl dome or whatever. Um, yeah. But, okay, so, so that's... All right. So that's step one. Also, I think that's just, I think just worth being said that there, there is like a, uh, like the, in some of the writings about this, there's like a sneaking kind of concept creep of like, there is going to be a lot more of this stuff we need to bury at some point. Like, I, I think, Oh, for sure. You know, like it's like, it'd be one thing if it was, okay, we have all the nuclear waste that, that we're going to need to bury and we just need to figure out where to, where to, where to put it. Um, but I think there is sort of this, like, we're not going to stop anytime soon <laughs> making waste. Well, and I think <laughs> like, a, a lot of the, a lot of the like thought process so far has been, we'll build short term storage facilities for this stuff for the next 10, 20, maybe up to like a hundred years. Yeah. And long term, uh, there'll be somebody, somebody else's else problem or we'll out. have better technology a hundred years from now to deal with this. Right. Yeah. The great kick the can down the road of all of our ecological solutions. Which is why I love though, these proposals and like what's happening in Finland and to a lesser extent here of like, it's two things that we never really do as a society, which is think of like really long term about our own actions. Right. And think about them uh, or act sp- purely out of, of someone else or for someone else's benefit. Right. Think, well, we're thinking because, long-term about how our actions are going to affect others, which is just like, as Americans, the last thing we ever do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and yeah, and all the, the mechanisms that we would use to communicate that, you know, it's like the, our, our very sort of technical minded culture would say like, just write a treatise and put it on an email server and then send it to people forever, you know, like make it this thing that you teach in school or what, you know, the very like technocratic solutions, but like, you yeah. know, the oldest message we have is a painting that somebody did with their fingers, you know, right. on a cave wall, like it, by, by like the flicker of firelight, you know, probably tripping on peyote or whatever. Like, like it's a very, uh, you know, rudimentary form of communication and a painter did it, you know? Right. And and then the, the stuff we have after that are stone blocks. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like nothing, nothing fancy lasts that long. Right. Yeah. Before we get to these proposals, let's take a quick break to talk about better help. If there's something that interferes with your happiness or prevents you from achieving your goals, check out BetterHelp. They can assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can connect with your therapist in a safe, private, online environment. It's super convenient and you can start communicating in less than 24 hours. You can send a message to your counselor anytime. They have iOS and Android apps. You can call, you can text, uh, and you can also set up weekly uh, video or phone sessions with your counselor. If you ever want to change counselors just because it's not a great fit or you have a new issue that you're dealing with, um, BetterHelp makes it super easy to do that and you can change it anytime for free. So if you're dealing with depression, stress, anxiety, uh, some family conflicts, relationship conflicts, sleep issues, self-esteem, anything that's giving you trouble, check out BetterHelp by going to betterhelp.com slash what if, and you'll get 10% off your first month of therapy. That's betterhelp.com slash what if for 10% off your first month. So, so, okay. So, um, proposal time. So, th- so this is my favorite part. So, so yeah. So we have solution one is suggested. Hey, don't do anything. Just leave the site entirely unmarked. Um, human curiosity is too powerful of a force to overcome. Just don't draw any attention to it. Um, yeah. Suggestion two. This is where it starts to get fun. Okay. So this guy Vilmos Voigt, who's a Buda- Budapestian. Is that how you say that? Budapest linguist. Sure, it can be. Yep. Uh, also uh, a folklore expert. Um, who suggested installing warning signs in important global languages that include instructions to translate into future languages. So not only would it be a warning, it would also be uh, a, a, an instruction to say, hey, after 100 years or so, translate this into the most relevant modern language and then put another yeah. sign a little bit further away from this one. 
So you have this sort so, of like, yeah, just put a repeat sign at the end of it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just so, take that bar and keep, keep looping it exactly. all the way out. And, and then, so then you have not only this, this warning sign, but you also have a way of almost like decoding past languages so that like, if you start at the most recent sign and mm-hmm. then go backwards, you also have this record of how language has changed. And that might help you decipher any other kind of technical documents that you might need to include in this facility. So is, is he saying like literal physical signs yeah. emanating like concentrically out from the, the point yep. where stuff is buried? Yep. And, and, and there, there is some debate in his, in his, uh, 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 proposal about we have what what form these signs um take like there some people were saying but you know you need to build actual like structures that housed these signs you know think like think like the mosaics in in um uh um pompeii that, that are still intact you know or or like like maybe scrolls on on you know writing things on on stone walls or whatever um or or like yeah cabinets that would be protected with something that might have papers in them or or just yeah physical signs like though those ideas just seem so short-sighted to me like yes that that's gonna survive a fucking ice age and right. plate shifts right and well and that's like, the thing is that it doesn't actually account for a hard reset of society right i mean if if you have a, a total loss of, of human culture and language that a, tra- a, a log of translatable language is not going to mean anything if you can't translate the first sign, you know, or, you know, after the next ice age, there's an earthquake and, <laughs> and your, some of your tablets over. break. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like if you have, if you don't have that picture in its entirety, it doesn't work. Yep. You, you may not be able to piece it together just from, it's part, contingent. It's every part of it is contingent on the other parts of it, which are, yeah, which is gradual. just like to me, a, the exact opposite approach of what you'd want to take here. Yep. Yeah. And the, the other, the other part of his proposal was uh, yeah, a facility that had a record of documents that were translated that would similarly be guarded, safeguarded like the material is. So it would be made to withstand things and it would, it would just have within it a record of translatable documents or tablets or whatever. And this is my favorite part that the building that had all the tablets in it would be built in such a way that it would whistle in the wind and call attention to itself. So like if you were walking around in the desert, you would hear like a, <laughs> you know, I'd be like, yeah, what? you'd be calling people <laughs> towards this thing. Uh, yeah. Vilmos is, is his whole program is dicked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like so. you're going to, you're going to house some records in something that someone's going to pick up and read in the year. One hundred and two thousand and twenty, <laughs> and understand? Yeah. Like, come on, bro. Uh, especially if, like, if it's actually only like year fourteen in this new time scale or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Well, yeah, and so and his things ended. His thing ended with um, the the actual terminal storage facility being surrounded with um, like scary uh, landscape features. Like, um, okay. Now, now we're getting somewhere. Right. Yep. So, so you have the whistle building and then once you're at the whistle building, it would direct you, <laughs> you call, it would direct you your call attention people towards the sharp pointy rocks. Yes. It was sharp pointy rocks. You're exactly right. <laughs> it was a, what he called a landscape of thorns, a mass of many irregularly okay. sized spikes protruding from the ground in all directions. Um, the other things that he called that, w- that might keep me away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other things that he called spike field, um, spikes bursting through grid, menacing earthworks, black hole, which would be an enormous slab of basalt or black dyed concrete, rendering the land uninhabitable and unfarmable. Um, rubble landscape, a large square shaped pile of dynamited rock, which over time would still appear an- anomalous and give a sense that something has been destroyed here. Or this is my favorite. Yeah, so one. you'd want to dig it up and find out what <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. The for, forbidden, no, forbidding blocks is my favorite one. A network of hundreds of housed sized housed sized stone blocks, dyed black and arranged in an irregular square grid, suggesting a network of streets in quotes streets. I don't know why streets in quotes, which feel <laughs> ominous and lead nowhere. The blocks are intended to make a large area entirely unsu- entirely unsuitable for farming or other future use. 
This so, guy just wants to build a maze. He does. And all of this stuff would draw me towards it. Even even the That's field of whole... black spikes. I'm like, nah, I want to check that out. That Dude, doesn't look like the surrounding area. Be, being the guy like exploring wherever, let's say Siberia for the first time after the reset of the year 50,000. Yeah. And you find a field of spikes. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just like, going to turn like, around and go the other way. You're like, that's an ox. Come on. That's a tree. That's a mountain. That's a Wait, what? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that's, that's a bunch of black houses in the middle of a field. <laughs> yeah. ah, better not go over there. I mean, they like, look, they it feel freaks ominous. me out. Like I'm probably going to go get a buddy, but I'm going to check yeah, it out. I'm going to bring more people yeah. over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to radiate more people. <laughs> All right, so that's Missile, Mr. Um, Mr. Voigt. Voigt. Vilmos Voigt. That's his idea. Um, okay, so next is um, Emil Kowalski, who is a Swiss nuclear physicist who proposed um, terminal storage sites that require high technical knowledge to access. So this actually makes me think even more. It makes me think of like Zelda temples, where it's just like... Yeah. Like just a I kept series. thinking about Zelda when I was reading this stuff today, yeah, for right? sure. Like, it's just a series of, like, puzzles that you have to solve. And you have to, like, I, I get the point that you, you need to have a certain level of technical advancement in order to be able to access something, you know, like, can you complete a series circuit or what? But basically all you're doing then is, like, yeah, you're just offering people, like, this unsolvable puzzle that they're going to try to use other methods to access. But, well... Yes, but if it's a technological puzzle, you could then, I think, increase the likelihood that someone who's able to access it would understand what it is and like therefore a, not want like a, to. A requisite level of of advancement that would probably like if, you, assume... if you made some if you made some sort of scanner where you had to hold up a Geiger counter to it to pass. Ah, like, yeah, you know about nukes, right? <laughs> right you can only like, get in here if you know about nukes, in which case, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to get in here yeah, for, bud? Exactly. Yep. Th- this one is a little more on the right track to me. Yeah. So, th- so that's Emil Kowalski. Um, okay. So now we're going to. One more thing on that one. Yep. In the, um, in that into eternity documentary they were talking about sort of this concept of like you probably aren't going to be drilling hundreds of meters into the ground if you don't have some some like fairly advanced technology right and one of the scientists working on the project brought up an example and i haven't looked into this yet but i guess in the 1600s there were swedish mining operations that got down like four, five, six hundred meters underground. Whoa. With I'm assuming no technology. Right. <laughs> or, you know, in the way that we think of it now. Yeah, yeah. So like a pretty uh That's deep. Simple mining operation could have gotten to the depths that we're burying this stuff at. Right, right. Yeah, and then be totally bl- it, they I mean if we found this shit now, they would have all died. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I maybe mean, they would probably also just create a religion around it or something. They'd be like, whoa, man, like, this is so cool. It lights up and stuff. It's got, like, a handprint. You can put your, whoa, dude. That's how the ancient Swiss talked, right? That's how they talked in 1600s Sweden. Hey, man, come look at this thing I can. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, was there more to that one, or was that sort no, of No, that's it. it. That, that's sure it. That... Basically, just create a super advanced puzzle that you can only solve okay. if you're sufficiently advanced. Yeah. Um, Okay, so again, he, b- totally by our standards and extremely contextual to now. Right. And but, you have to like actually be there to do it, which you're already like again, you're yeah. inviting people to the place. Um yeah. Okay, so here's a really fucked one. And I didn't actually ever find who was the progenitor of this idea. It was just presented as another wacky idea in the semiotics conference was <laughs> the idea of <laughs> an elevator. <laughs> that was timed to emerge from the terminal storage facility once a year and radiate the surrounding area. And the surrounding area would have um, unique cacti planted in a weird like labyrinth pattern around it. And so once a year, uh, this elevator would emerge to the surface, radiate the surrounding area 
and mutate and kill a bunch of this plant life and then go back underground. So it would just release like a little bit of radiation once a year. And then the idea would be that anybody who stumbled on this landscape would see this like mutilated, like dead, twisted like landscape and would think like, oh, there's something bad about this place. I don't want to be Dude, here. <laughs> I have so many problems with this one. <laughs> First of all, if I see an elevator in the middle of nowhere, I'm fucking getting in it. Yeah, exactly, dude. Well, especially <laughs> so this dude had included and he's like, you could have like a time, uh, a counting mechanism um, so that people could tell how many times the elevator had surfaced so that you could count <sighs> how many years it had been. And then you could know how dangerous the material still was. And maybe it would like announce how many years it had been doing it when it, when it surfaced. So the idea would be this elevator would pop up from underground and go like 117. <laughs> <laughs> and then go back uh, underground. <laughs> Cause, you, <laughs> Cause you're going to stand outside for a year yeah. and just wait for this thing to pop up. Yeah. Right. Also where, how is he building this elevator that works for a hundred thousand years without maintenance? Right. Don't know. God, you might <laughs> as well just have somebody probably. like you might as well just hire somebody right now <laughs> and tell him his job is just to scream go away yeah, yeah, right. please and go then, away and i am gonna have and, my kids here and tell them to go away yeah and part two of your job is before you die you have to hire someone else to do the same thing right well like, that's, that's actually, a better idea that's than what this dude just pretty proposed. similar to one of the other ideas we're getting to actually. <laughs> great <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so then there's this guy, Stanislaw Lem, who you may have heard of. He's a Polish sci-fi writer. Um, he wrote the, the book Solaris, um, which became a hit movie. Um, so he has a number of ideas, and these are all pretty fun. Is this the plant guy? Uh, this is the plant guy, yep. Nice. So one of his ideas was um, to put satellites in space that would transit, uh, transmit data uh, to Earth for a millennia. That was one of his ideas. There's obviously problems with that, but... Uh, you know, there's the language problem, there's the data problem, there's the maintenance problem, there's reception problem, like you have to have receiver facilities that also stay active. Um, but, but, you know, you could conceivably say like, well, what if they translate on, on, transmit on all conceivable like wavelengths and, you know, VHF and UHF and, and radio waves and all this stuff. It's an interesting idea, but it has a lot of problems. But the one you mentioned is his the interesting part of his proposal, which would be the biological coding of DNA to mathematically automatically reproduce um, plants that he called information plants. Um, and these plants would grow only near the terminal storage site. Um, and these things that he, he called them information plants or atomic flowers would contain coded in their DNA data about the location and um, uh, quality of the contents or information about the contents of the terminal storage facility. And he really, I mean, this is clearly the, the invention of like a sci-fi writer who thinks it sounds, I mean, obviously this sounds really cool, but there's immediate questions like, dude, I see flowers every day. At no point am I like, yo, I wonder if one of these flowers has DNA information coded into it to tell, well, to reveal something about. However, if you were to, if there was a location on earth where it's the only place where this variety of plant grows, mm. it's like the Edelweiss. You're conveying, you're conveying part of the message, which is like, this place is different. Yeah. Right. And you're encouraging, like if people may try and find out whatever they can about that plant, because and conceivably, it's like these would grow at, yeah, the, the only like a certain number of places. Like cause conceivably there's more than one terminal site. Right. So it would be exactly. like, yeah. oh, it only grows like in this six foot circle around this place in New Mexico, this place in Finland, you know, but it's it's like super concentrated and maybe it looks freaky or it looks weird, you know. And then I could see also another, like a, the next logical step being, well, what we need to find out what's different about these locations. Yes. We need to study specifically the earth in these locations. Yeah, maybe like dig now, down. <laughs> Well, yeah, you don't want people to go too far. Maybe just like a few feet. Like soil, though. You're not going to study the bedrock, right? You're right. going to study the soil. Right. This is not the worst idea. I mean, and there's, I mean, we can get into, like, you know, Terrence McKenna does think that there's some 
information encoded in certain plants DNA that we just have yet to to really like specifically mushrooms yeah yeah (laughs) mainly mushrooms (laughs) but that that they are their own sort of like biological golden record that we just haven't translated yet um yeah so maybe mushrooms only grow on like extremely dangerous things that we shouldn't be touching like they're cursed or some shit (laughs) Do, do we know if this is actually possible like could we do that can we encode information into plants dna i guess it would depend on what kind of um, language where you, I mean, if you think of like a binary <laughs> language, like I think you could probably no, the plants <laughs> just scream. No. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, if you look at them under a microscope, it just says, uh, it just Go says away. no, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, probably a better idea, actually. Um, so that's uh, that's Stanislaw Lem, uh, Atomic Flowers. Um, okay. h- here's another author list proposal, uh, one expert. Proposed. Uh, weren't there like there were like eight people on these on this panel people couldn't even put their names to them right yeah some people like, were like nah fuck that shit fuck that. The, the way that i imagined this happening <laughs> yeah, yeah, check out this one though i didn't write it but like <laughs> well, mm, well, this, is pretty actual, good. this idea seems cool to me huh the, the actual report is very sober it's it's very like um you know uh here are certain societal models of long-term messages like there are these folk tales that have been oral traditions that have lasted this long there's you know blah 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 but but there's a there's a whole other like myth about this this convention that happened this meeting that happened where and lots of people have written about it afterwards like yo I was at this crazy Department of Energy meeting and this dude suggested this and this dude suggested this the way that I picture the meeting is basically a bunch of people getting shit there's probably a ton of cocaine but people got shit faced sat around and went like sure. wait wait dude <laughs> atomic flowers bro think about it. <laughs> And then everyone sat around and was like, well, but how are you going to... Fu- oh, yeah, you know, you're right. And then they probably sat in yo, silence I, for a while. And then some other dude we said, really need to, yo, we what need if we... This is, this, is the, this is the one expert. He didn't put his name on it or her name on it. <laughs> what if we wrote a message on an artificial moon and launched it into orbit? Because <laughs> think about it. It would always be visible in the night sky and the warning would be impossible to forget. <laughs> That's one of the ideas. An artificial moon. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Yep. Dude, I wonder, like, first of all, I need to interview the one woman that was on this panel. Right. (laughs) Secondly, this shit is fascinating in the context of, like, why do we have the myths that we have about other things? Right. Yep. I mean, think about that song, the fucking um, Ring Around the Rosie. I mean, that's a great example of like long-term message communication that was a warning. And that's how old? I don't know. When did the Black Plague happen? It was like three, four hundred years old. Right. <laughs> I mean, we're long. talking about <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> like a thousand times longer than that is what we need here. Right. But like e- even myths of like, you know, uh, like stuff like Atlantis or sure. great floods, you know all the like star people myths and stuff like right. that stuff gets, we dismiss that after just a few thousand years or less. Right. Can you, you, I got to imagine like if this information survived for 20, 50, a hundred thousand years, it would disaggregate somehow. Be yeah. Com- completely and like separate from its context. Right. Or like, how would we, like I don't know if this is a, at the end of the day is a solvable problem honestly well, the, and that's, the communication part of it that that is some people's conclusion is just like we don't there isn't a way to do it um but but you know that I think that opens up a space where it's like okay well then we need to get these nerds out of here and bring in crazier people to think of crazier ideas cuz like also, s- some of the ideas are they just seem like they seem like it would work but it's just not doable yet. Like uh, the pro- probably the most famous one. You saw the Ray Cat, I assume. Yeah. What, what, one more thing, just on the the time scale thing before yeah, we yeah. get to the super off the rails shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the one thing that I, seems obvious, but I wasn't thinking about at first, is the threat decreases exponentially over time. Right. True. And so really the most important 
time for this message to be conveyed is the first like thousand to couple thousand years. Right. If you dug this up 50,000 years from now, you might like get sick, but it's not going to kill you. It's not going to render half the planet uninhabitable. Right. Right. So the messaging that's like, I think geared more towards the like midterm uh, like length. That's probably the priority then. Yeah. Yeah. Like it makes sense to prioritize that over like, can we convey this exactly as we want a hundred thousand years from now? Right. No, that's a good point. Cause also like, what are the chances that human beings are still here in a hundred thousand years? <laughs> Almost zero. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's certainly not a hundred. And who knows? I mean, maybe the stuff that is here, I don't know. Maybe radiation will be really good for them or something. Maybe they eat radiation. Right. Who knows? <laughs> All right, uh, cats. Cats. So the two most wild solutions, obviously, I saved for the end. Um, <laughs> the first of which is called, and it is called this, this is the name of the proposal. It's called the Ray Cat Solution. And this is by a dude named Paolo Fabri, who's a, a, a Frenchman. Um, and I actually don't really know what his job was. I should have looked that up. But um, he came up with this basically, I mean, a huge portion of this task force was was just concerned with researching what are the long-term messages that we have? What are the things that have stayed with human civilization for as long as we can, uh, you know, uh, perceive. And, and one of the things that he came up with was like, yo, cats, cats have been around since ancient Egypt. Like cats and humans have cohabitated for a very long time. And cats have represented symbolic importance obviously in the past um in in egypt and in in other places there are images of cats um and so he came up with this idea and i love this idea so much it's so good um (laughs) to genetically modify cats to change colors when exposed to radiation so that's the first part so first you have to somehow find a way to genetically modify cats to become like feline geiger counters and glow. I, I came across a great short documentary about this. It's like 15 minutes. Yeah. And there are people actually working on that part of the I was going to say, yeah, there are, there's, there's a guy named Kevin Chen who is a biologist um, and a founder of a biohacker laboratory. And he is working on this solution right now. Uh, he has started so, with bacteria and like, you know, from certain, certain animals that, that do have the ability to change colors or, you know, bioluminescent algae or whatever. Um, and it's going to attempt to sort of graduate up to cats eventually. So bacteria <laughs> to to worms to, you know, mice to cats or whatever eventually. I think that's the same guy that's in the documentary I was watching. Okay. Anyway, I'll let you uh, lay this out. And then I have many questions Great. about this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so, so the idea would be these, these cats or whatever creatures, I mean, the the cat is the best one, obviously. Um, that would, that would that change. The, that's got to be like the earliest domesticated animal, right? I wondered about that because you know, I dogs just did a quick Google and it says time. like four, four to five thousand BC. So okay, so yeah, maybe six I mean, to I seven think of thousand like, years. Like canines and and like early wolves and stuff is being. Uh, some people say that actually wolves domesticated humans and just taught them to give them food. Oh. Um, the, the first result on Google says 15,000 years ago for dogs. So we should really be making bioluminescent dogs. dogs. Right, right. But dogs don't have the mystique. C- cats have this, like, I don't know, this, like, a- like ageless, like, alien quality. that they, they are very, like, mystical creatures, you know? Well, yeah, and the second half of this is that you need to create a myth around it, right? Right, Or a yes. legend or a story. Exactly. So, so the, the other half of his proposal was and this is probably the most important part was that you needed to make not just cats ray cats an in, indispensable part of human culture um so like we mentioned the um the uh, ring around the rosy song so you need to come up with like nursery rhymes songs myths sculptures paintings um 
that all which featured, people have made for this Raycat thing. By they the way. have, and that's that's <laughs> a, an amazing thing that this has become like kind of like a meme. And and when it was proposed to the Human Interference Task Force, the couple of people that were heading it up sort of dismissed it. They're like, "Yeah, well, that's fun, but whatever." Which is a problem, I think, with this with this um, this uh, fact seeking, you know, research uh, initiative is that. Many of, the, of these things are dismissed as kind of silly, but I, it might actually just have to be a, a wacky weirdo idea like this for it to actually it, do anything. Well, and the fact yeah, that I mean, it those has are become, the only ones really worth listening to, to me, like exactly any sort of normal n- now based idea just isn't going to cut it. Right. Yeah. And the fact that it has started to spread after actually being um, snubbed from the report just speaks to the efficacy of the idea. Um, or at least the, 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 the humor and memeable, uh, aspect of, of the idea. Yeah, I mean, this is mostly still a terrible idea, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's awesome. It, There's... It, the, the 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 type of thinking being employed is is I think what That's we need. Right. Get out get out of the box. Get out of the terminal yeah. storage facility. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just I love the idea of these like glowing cat sculptures that people would have to like you know make these sort of like holidays to have these mythical like stories and celebrations around the the ray cat sculpture and the childhood songs and the and and just the the idea like it's it's such a cinematic idea of like a like a nine-year-old child you know three thousand years from now in like a a windswept prairie like stumbling upon this like cat and and then it just you know maybe like softly singing the ray cat song to itself and then just like glowing and the child like getting scared and running away like i just love that what, what it makes your imagination do you like okay when would yeah. this actually work it's one thing to say like it's a cool way of thinking about building a message but imagining the reception of the message and the effect of it is actually the most interesting part t- to think about okay totally agree and we already like sort of have an example of this more recently with canaries and coal mines right we yeah. just we just need to do the same thing but with glowing cats <laughs> yeah, and teach exactly. people that whenever you see a glowing cat you got to get the fuck out run yeah run and then in somehow some have direction it for a hundred thousand years right uh there are so many holes in this idea though <laughs> like my first cat of all, likes to sit on the microwave <laughs> <laughs> first of all if you can see a cat and it's glowing you're being irradiated, <laughs> right? Yes. Like correct. it's already too late. Is it correct. not? Right. Because it's, it's okay. It's so this whole idea is, is engineered to, to change colors when it's exposed to radiation. Yes. Yeah, so you are also being exposed to radiation at that point. Correct. So the idea then is at least you can at least it. go tell others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. Or like you could tell your whole village or, or a city or something like, yo, don't go over here anymore. Little Sally just grew a hand out of her forehead. <laughs> well, and yeah. And then the other part is like, wouldn't this also require there just being cats everywhere all the time? <laughs> yeah, right. Or like, yeah, a person settling a new place would have to like bring a whole cage full of these ray cats and let them like Tester roam cats. around. Yeah, yeah. They're like minesweepers kind of. And then the idea that we could we could figure that out but would have no ability to test for radiation in the future. <laughs> like the first time this happened, wouldn't we just be like, Oh, well it's radiation. Well, or couldn't we just like, like it just doesn't create take a myth about account. radiation being bad. Yeah, that's true. Well, and that is actually the final, I don't want to say final solution. That is the final proposal. Um, the, the anyway, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but also it doesn't take into account. Like what if the cat evolves to glow when exposed to yeah, what, other things. What does a hundred thousand years of evolution do to this idea? Right. Yeah. And where, where else like low levels of radiation do we have in our, in our civilization where the cats will start glowing? Yeah. Or what if they evolved to glow when exposed to like, I don't know, carbon monoxide or something. I mean, maybe that would also be helpful. <laughs> oxygen. <but>. Oxygen. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Now we just have glowing cats everywhere. <laughs> And everyone is running and from everyone everywhere. is constantly running away from them. And then everyone, decides, to find areas then with everyone no oxygen. decides to become a subterranean civilization because the cats <laughs> yeah, are going exactly. everywhere. And then they dig right into the terminal oxygen. facility. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, 
We tried. Or maybe it feels really good when they glow and all the cats kill themselves by seeking out radiation. Ooh, that's I like. <laughs> or they that mutate one. because they've been exposed to so much radiation. Right. We're gonna have a whole fleet. The whole planet's gonna be run by X Men cats. <laughs> they're all glowing though, so you can tell when they're coming. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All so right, what's this? What's this last one? This last one, and we've been kind of like eating around the edges of of an idea that's sort of like this. But the the final solution, final proposal is <laughs> um, is something that that Thomas uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name Thomas Sebok Sebok uh, Thomas A Sebok um, sure had had proposed after studying again like the the longest lasting messages of our civilization so um, other than cats we also have things like the Catholic Church things like uh, Judaism, you know, thing th- there are there are ancient pagan religions that we still have uh, certain um, rites, rituals, traditions, and myths uh, from. Um, so he thought, okay, let's come up with a uh, semi like ecclesiastic order of these like mystical um, priest like figures, and he called it the atomic priesthood. And the idea was these um, like cloistered like nuclear monks would safeguard and shepherd this warning about these places throughout history. Um, and that they would, they would have a, a, uh, dogmatic, um, you know, expression that they, they would be able to teach to people. They'd be able to like, um, try to safeguard this, this message in its, in its most pure form. They would elect future members of the priesthood and would instill this message in the civilization so that even if, the, the priesthood itself died um, or the priesthood itself, you know, eventually stopped um, electing new members or somehow um, became disillusioned that, that the myth would still be somewhere at the bedrock of, of human civilization. Now this idea um, has been kind of played with, I think, I think even Asimov maybe has a short story about this. Um, but, but it's been played out by a number of sort of futurist or sci-fi authors who basically all come to the conclusion that like this works, but it's also disastrous. Like if you play this out, a, some sort of message can be communicated over thousands of years, but the, what happens to the message over time is so disastrous that it's actually better not trying to do this at all. Like, someone how so like like the 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 order of priests that you have selected to to safeguard this message actually become um super secretive about it and they they manage to sort of like accumulate societal and political power around their access oh. to this knowledge oh, and, oh you mean like the catholic church you mean like the catholic church exactly <laughs> right but yeah so so then they you know you mean like how that's been disastrous lately? right and yeah you have this outsized power and you have some sort of like revealed access to knowledge that you hold over other people's heads or you know maybe you use the actual material in the in the sites to 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 wage you know chemical warfare on people because you're the only group of people that know that this stuff exists or um you know maybe the message splits so maybe you've got like there's some warning about something somewhere and then some other you know denomination of the of the atomic priesthood has the more technical details about just nuclear waste in general you know like they could it could the message could dissolve into like multiple streams like a weird game of telephone um and and basically the idea would be like human ego and incompetence would muck this up somehow yeah well and then how do you deal with the like just disseminating this information because you need everyone to know mm-hmm. right yeah sort of or or you need everyone to do as you say at least yeah and that's never going to work and i and i think that the idea behind like selecting the people would be like they're not the only people that know about this they're just the only people that know like why they're doing it that it's like they know that there's um harmful waste buried somewhere in these locations but the message that they're actually communicating is much more basic it's much more lo-fi and it's much more low-tech the 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 message would be something like there is a cursed land that long ago people visited and grew ill or or you know died 
And if you go there, the, an unseen force will invade you and, you know, lead to your death. And, and so, but and, then you're back to the curiosity thing of like some, at least some people are going to be drawn to that place because of that. Indeed. I mean, how well do these 10 commandments work out? <laughs> And then it also, it also doesn't account for any sort of hard reset situation like you were talking about earlier. That's true. We're like, yes, the Catholic church is an example of this to an extent, but we're still talking about like 2000 years. 2000 years. Yep. We're talking about 2% of the time that we potentially need to account for here. Yep. So then you come all the way back to the oldest thing we have is just a, is a handprint and a couple of horses on a cave wall, you know? So, so, you, so then you come yeah. back to just symbol, like, can you, can you conceive of a symbol? So then it is back to, you have the engineering problem and now it's just a, it's a pretty simple design problem. It's just, can you come up with a scary enough symbol that anybody who is shown to in focus groups or whatever, from many different cultures can look at and say, that looks dangerous, which is something Does that it have to be visual. As opposed to like audio or. Yeah. Or I don't know any, any of our other senses. Um, I don't know how you would. I, yeah. I guess audio is probably the, the easiest to work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's an could interesting you, solution. Then you got the could whistle you design. Thing. Yeah. Like something along those lines where it like it creates some sound that is just so miserable that no one would want to go there mm. or some other sort of sensation that is just like inherently bad. Uh, like radiation poisoning. Well, <laughs> bad, but not fatal. Right. Right. No, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. That, like, you know, there's some, there's some like, uh, like non-lethal weapons that can make your skin really hot. For instance, that people have been experimenting yeah. with something like that. Maybe when people are experiencing like ghosts and, uh, other sorts of paranormal activity. It's just ancient humans trying to well, and see, tell us th- not to go to what, certain places. When, whenever I think about this, this is what I keep thinking about is like, are there, are there messages that have been sent from past civilizations or who knows? I mean, back from future civilizations that we, that we are experiencing on an everyday basis or, or whatever that, that we're just not recognizing. I mean, how many warnings are out there that, that are things that this civilization took very seriously that we just are not capable of really perceiving like people right. like Stonehenge is a tourist destination, but maybe like that shape to them or those types of rocks or whatever, maybe that was like terrifying. They're like, nobody's going to fucking want to be around this place. Like, look at this. It's terrifying. Right. It's like this giant <laughs> imposing rocks. Like no one would want to come in or yeah, or Sphinx or whatever. Like, I mean, obviously Did you that see the, you see the thing recently about how Stonehenge might be, uh, or somebody made like a, a scale model of it and did a bunch of acoustic tests on it. And it does a really good job of amplifying sounds that originate inside of it and keeping out sounds that originate outside of it. Whoa. Like some kind of like meditation amphitheater. Yeah. Basically like a, a meeting gathering space slash amphitheater thing. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. But yeah, we, I mean, I think that's for sure possible. And again, revisiting the idea of like a hard human reset, we would have no way of knowing if that's happened before either. Right. Yep. True. Totally. There are certainly events which could and would and maybe have wiped out any records of what would have happened before it. And I mean, there, there have been human civilizations since humans have been around that, you know, have had endings that we don't really have a whole lot of record from. Um, right. And we, we don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's worth thinking that there are, there are like in the same way that nuclear waste, um, uh, incurs physical harm. I think it's very likely that there are psychological harms that certain civilizations discovered and attempted to communicate to future generations, like philosophical harms, you know, um, Mm. that they might've attempted to communicate that we don't have access to. You know, like maybe there's some kind of secret out there that's like, here's how to never have depression, you know, and you just got to stop doing this one thing, you know, then they tried to fucking make a <laughs> monument about it. And, you know, 
we just don't we don't understand it. We can't read it. Maybe that's like what you know certain the, the ziggurat in whatever is like trying to tell us. It's like yo, you guys are doing it the wrong way. Like you actually just need to like stand on your left foot for thirty seconds every other day. And do this. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm being stupid, but you know what I mean. Like it's just it's just this plant, dude. Yeah, like how, like transferring <laughs> wisdom. Yeah, just light this plant on fire and inhale it. it chills you right <laughs> out, dude. Um, so, so in, in conclusion, there you know that there's there's a this crazy problem. There's all these wild solutions, but the cool thing about it is that there is still a conference um, that meets once a year to brainstorm and have they have like breakout groups. And they have a gallery where artists come in and they um, display um, sort of just musings about this. Um, and it's called the Conference of Constructing Memory, the International Conference and Debate Whoa. on Radioactive Waste Management and Constructing Memory for Future Generations. And they publish reports whenever they have, and maybe it's not annual, maybe it's every few years, but they publish reports whenever they have meetings. And you can actually read um, summaries of all the lectures. You can see samples of some of the art that they've done, and you can read summaries of the breakout conversations that they have. Um, and they kind of said what you said earlier. They're like, well, there is no single mechanism alone that can accomplish the task of communicating this, me- this message. It's possible. It's conceivable that there are maybe some of these solutions in combination with one another, might be able to at least in the medium term communicate a message for, you know, like, like you said, the most dangerous um, part of, of the decay. Um, But they have committed to continue to meet and to continue to brainstorm. And uh, yeah, so I think, I, I don't think it's private. I mean, I don't imagine why it wouldn't be. So if you are listening out there and you have some kind of awesome idea, um, you can attend this conference and be a part of, that brainstorming, which I think is rad. I'm going to go next year and just present my don't do anything. Yeah. Idea. I like just that. fucking leave it. I'm going to go there and be like, have you thought about just sending it into space? Like put it on a rocket, dude. And just like dude, shoot that, it into space. That's a real, I- that's a real idea that was proposed early on. Was it really? Yeah. I mean, it would just like send that shit into the sun. The oh, problem right, is if you don't, right. If you don't get it into space, then everyone dies. That's exactly right. If it blows up on <laughs> you the, blow it on up the, the atmosphere, we're all fucked. We're all fucked. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or on the on the launch pad, and you know. Right, and also just good luck getting every other nation to agree to like, oh yeah, you want to put a bunch of nuclear material on a rocket and launch it, and we're just supposed to believe that it's going out of the atmosphere. <laughs> cool, bro. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if all like, of the Russia's Swiss are going to accidentally land on the east coast of the U.S. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> So that is oh, the story boy. of the atomic priesthood and the Ray cats. Yep. That was fun, man. Yeah, dude. Very fun. Thanks for letting Thanks me on. For man. I appreciate out. that. Yeah, this is great, dude. This could talk to you. Yeah, you as well. I saw that, uh, that petition. <laughs> so I, ho- I hope you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> all 12 of all 12 of you who signed that. Oh, they got 12 got signatures. Lydia. Hell yeah. I, I think it was up to, yeah, it was somewhere in there. You got That's at least awesome. a dozen. Well, you yeah. know, in, in an age of, of lack of political legitimacy and complete uh, social immiseration. I'm glad people are using their, their, uh, their, their power <laughs> where it counts. Yeah. Keep it up. Keep up the pressure. <laughs> All right, buddy. <laughs> All right, man. I love you. Talk to you soon. Much love. Peace. Peace.